Meantime, let's get back to Robinhood. We've got early investor Jason Calacanis with us now. And Jason, we're looking at the early indications, but how do we judge this IPO and its pricing? If it opens at $38, which it's indicated to do so, was it priced exactly right? But does that risk consumer customer loyalty from users that got an allocation and were counting on a pop, especially given what we've seen from other big IPOs over the last year or so? Well, thanks for having me and uh, congratulations to the Robinhood team. In terms of the pop, actually, nothing would be better than for it to be priced perfectly and stay at the same price for a couple of months. I think uh, any retail investors who are new to the game, uh, it would be a great lesson for them to buy and hold things for a long time. That is really where the great wins come from. I've been lucky enough to be an investor in two of these companies that have gone public in the cycle, Uber and now Airbnb. Uh, now, uh, Robinhood, and I missed Airbnb. Uh, but if you look at those three companies, boy, they've changed the world. And if you were lucky enough to get into them, I think holding them for a decade is the right move. We've seen that with Amazon, Netflix, you know, Google, Facebook. A lot of times the gains don't uh, just happen in the private markets. They happen in the public markets over decades. And so I'm still long the company, obviously, with 22 million, inve with 22 million customers. Uh, Robinhood is doing phenomenal. And I'm really interested to see what they do next. Jason, we've talked in the past about the regulatory risks, the business model payment for order flow. The bull case for this company, though, which I know you've talked a lot about, is its young, huge customer base. But how does Vlad Tenev make sure that Robinhood doesn't become a feeder for other financial firms, not traditional banks, but the more established fintechs like PayPal and Square that have built up customer loyalty over many more years? You know, it's, we, we, we have a very vibrant, competitive marketplace here in America uh, where these companies have to keep performing. So you're exactly right. If they don't keep delighting their customers, there are plenty of people who will delight those customers. Uh, one of the great things is the amount of trust Robinhood has built, despite some of the, you know, GameStop things that have happened and, and uh, the issues around payment for order flow, which seem to be an issue for some group of people, but not for the actual customers of Robinhood. Um, you know, I, I think if you look at what they could add to the product, bank accounts, mortgages, 401ks, Roths, retirement, you know, 529s for people's kids. We, we've got a generation of people who now have learned finance at a very young age by doing it. And, and that's something here on CNBC you've been talking about, having more market participants. And when I invested in the company, the idea that 20 more retail, 20 million more retail investors would join the party and uh, you know, start investing in stocks and take control of their financial destiny, which is really what this is about. I mean, that is yeah. the goal of the companies for people to take uh, control of their financial destiny and have agency in financial markets that are competitive and complex. It's a great point, Jason, and we would obviously everyone would love to see stock participation in aggregate go up and help people yeah. uh, take advantage of the markets. I do want to ask you about about the competition and and when when Tenev was asked about it this morning, what the moat was, he said it was the brand. To your point, but it's not like other companies don't have carefully tailored brands that have they've been refining over decades and decades of work. I mean, is that like trying to sell an Oldsmobile to a young guy right now? I do think you, you make a good point there at the end, which is sometimes these paradigm shift and brands just have a hard time, uh, you know, appealing to the next generation, whether it was Yahoo or, you know, AOL, you know, they just didn't cross the chasm and, and make it to that next group of, of customers. So I, I think this group of customers in their 20s and 30s, they're just starting and they're probably getting started 10 years before all of us did, uh, you know, who are watching on the show or maybe 20 or 30 years before some of us did. And so that really is the upside. They, this is a company that has always operated with a sense of urgency and by building absolutely stunning, gorgeous experiences for users, which reminds me of Airbnb, which reminds me of Google and Facebook, you know, the, uh, the, and Uber, just the quality of the product is, is paramount in this industry because it's so competitive. Mm. And you have to constantly be offering new things. And, you know, he sort of talked a little bit about this this week of, hey, maybe there's more products to come. And when he pitched it to me in the early days before the product was even launched, uh, he, he did have a very, very big vision for the, for the company. Jason, yeah, I mean, is there a brand message mismatch here to some degree? Like, with gamification. I mean, it's like Robin Hood got popular selling pizza, but they're saying the future is broccoli in a way. And that healthy behavior that you mentioned that you want to see Robin Hood have, like that model is not how Robin Hood 
grows and makes money. They make money off of options trading and people buying and selling often and playing momentum, not necessarily buying and holding. So what does that mean for this as a stock? I had a lot of pizza when I was young and I'm eating a lot of broccoli now. So I do think that people's lives change over time and maybe they want to be very active trading stocks every day and you know even crypto because they can do it 24 hours a day and they like the rush of that and really rolling up their sleeves and placing bets, whether they're doing that on sports, crypto or stocks. And then at a certain point you realize, wow, you know, I sold that stock too soon and you got to ride your winners. And it's about the amount of time in the market, not timing the market. And and that's just a natural evolution. So I I think a lot of people are, you know, hating on a company that is really doing a phenomenal job of educating folks. And they will come to this conclusion on their own when they have a child or they need an apartment. Young people will say, you know what, what what is that 529? How does that work? Oh, how does a Roth work? How did Peter Thiel make so much money? Oh, he was investing in companies. Oh, I got it. And so that's the education we're seeing here. Yes, I know it's new. Yes, I know gamification, all this stuff. But, you know, if you go to tell me the throttling we're putting on young people going to Vegas before they go play craps for the first time or roulette or go to a poker tournament. Tell me what explain to me, you know, how the NBA and fantasy and wagering sites are throttling young people when they start engaging on those wagering platforms. They're not. They're not. And. Uh, I think people have to have agency yeah, the, and learn for themselves. We can't live in a that, nanny state. If you're going to bet casinos, on stocks, that is a good thing to learn how to do. That is my position. You should learn how to bet on stocks sure, when you're a but teenager. Casinos, casinos and betting sites aren't painting themselves as sort of democratizing finance, the same kind of philosophy yeah. that Robinhood may be putting out there to its users. Anyways, Jason, yeah. as always, well, thanks for Well, that's because the casinos we'll are rigged against the users and equities are rigged for consumers. <laughs> a discussion for another time, Jason. Some might argue that payment for order flow could have issues like that. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers.